So I've been doing a lot of thinking about construction tech lately. There are a few major platforms that are publicly traded, such as Procore and Autodesk, but there's so many more companies that are just starting out and there's so many opportunities out there. So I've interviewed a few entrepreneurs lately in the space, but my guest today, Lauren Weston, has an inside track on what's happening in construction tech. She's an associate at Tom Best and she focuses on early stage investments across financial technology and real estate verticals. She previously worked in equity research at Morgan State. Stanley, where she covered residential and commercial real estate companies. Welcome, Lauren. Deidre, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and chat more about construction technology. Awesome. One of the things I just love about TomVest is you guys create the coolest maps where you've got, you really sort of lay out all of the different companies uh, in a particular vertical. So you've got over 150 of them in the construction tech map, and uh, we'll show that in the video. But um, how did how do you decide which ones end up in which sector? And how do you define construction tech as a whole? Yeah, that's a great uh, question and starting point. You know, I, I'll take a step back and, you know, my background in real estate, I think, informs my view on construction. And the way that I conceptualized it was thinking about everything that touches the supply of real estate across property types, right? So that's residential, commercial, that's industrial, that's infrastructure. It is literally every real asset and the technology that touches every part of the value chain from the design and build to the procurement of materials, to the collaboration software that's used in the field, to even the companies that focus on reality capture and capturing data on the job site. I think the other way to conceptualize construction technology is thinking about um, the horizontal platforms that are involved in the full life cycle of a project. So the financing of the construction, payments, um, ensuring a construction project, as well as think about marketplaces that facilitate the supply and demand and exchange of goods, construction materials, um, equipment, and even labor. And so that's a starting point, but within that, there's so much more we can talk about. Absolutely. I like that on the map, you've got it broken down into those kinds of sectors, field tools, the analytics, those tech-enabled builders. Where do you see the biggest areas of growth right now? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Something I think a lot about. Um, there are so many areas for innovation. I think the area that I'm most focused on is the intersection of fintech and construction technology and specifically payments, lending, and insurance, um, and how those aspects of financing um, construction and financing the supply of real estate are changing. And maybe to be more specific, I can talk about lending. The process today is slow and costly. There is a draw process that involves multiple stakeholders and coordination, extensive coordination between borrowers, lenders, and even third-party inspectors who do on-site inspections on a monthly basis. And I'm seeing so many companies that are trying to expedite this process um, using data, using collaboration software. And I think the goal that I've seen across so many different approaches is enabling trust and transparency in a process that has historically not had a lot of trust. And that's lending, right? Um, another big area is payments. So today, um, delayed payments are really detrimental to the industry. They also drive up overall project costs, and I can explain why. Um, essentially, um, owners pay uh, general contractors, then pay subs, and it takes on average more than 30 days for subs to get paid. But subs have to pay on a weekly and biweekly basis for materials and then their own labor cost for other subcontractors. So there's a working capital problem here. Um, as a result, subcontractors have been footing the bill from their own retirement savings, from their credit cards, from their personal um, expenses or, or um, accounts to really um, pay for things that are driving up construction costs. So payments is a big area that I think can unlock a lot of innovation. The last area is insurance. Essentially, you know, over the last five to 10 years, there's been more data on job sites than ever before. You have IoT devices tracking worker safety. You have software documenting construction projects. So there's more data than ever, but the data isn't actually being captured in underwriting processes. And it's not yet reflected in premiums for insurance. 
And so there's a disconnect there between the data that's out there and the data that's actually being organized and aggregated for the insurance process. So those are three areas that I'm really excited about. Um, there's a lot more there, but those are three. That's really interesting. And I think you made a very uh, good point there about the the drop process in general. Because one of the things when I talk to entrepreneurs and developers and I'm seeing this, that fragmentation at the construction site level, you know, you talked about the subcontractors and that's one of the issues is that the subcontractors all sort of exist in their own universe and they're not necessarily talking to each other, talking to the developers, owners, architects. One of the things I'm really focused on as I look at these companies is the communication between all of the subs. How do you see that evolving? Yeah, that's a really good question. And maybe I'll do a little bit of a history lesson to talk about how we got to where we are in terms of the fragmentation that you talk about, because it's very much a reality of where we are. We're in a phase of a lot of point solutions. And taking a step back, if you look back at the long arc of the history of construction, let's say project management, collaboration software, dating back to the 80s and 90s, you had essentially accounting firms such as Sage, Viewpoint, CIMC, um, selling project management to construction firms. It was not purpose-built. It was really accounting firms and ERP solutions that bolted on project management. And that was the sort of dominant um, source there. Then in the 90s and early 2000s, we had Procore, we had Builder Trend, eSub, um, what I'd call purpose-built cloud-based software or the emergence of that. Um, And Procore really dominated by saying, hey, um, there are iPhones and tablets. We're going to leverage mobile, leverage cloud, and deliver project management software. I'd say in the last 10 years, we've seen companies iterate um, on on the back of Procore and Autodesk and focus on niche pain points um, that were either underutilized or underserved um, on the broader project management platforms. So you've seen companies like Brick, uh, they're a startup focus on financial forecasting. You've seen companies focus on resource management. So managing and optimizing your labor, your materials, and your crews. You've seen companies focus on just pre-construction. And so I'd say we've moved from, you know, on-premise project management software to cloud-based project management software to now cloud-based point solutions that focus on all the areas that weren't quite served before. And I think the goal and the focus for all the point solutions is to become platforms by engaging more stakeholders. So not just selling to subs, but now engaging the GCs and then ultimately engaging owners and becoming more of a platform from a point solution. And the way you do that is by engaging more stakeholders as well as what I call Um, you know, becoming the system of record versus a system of engagement, which is maybe used once or twice a week or, you know, on a really infrequent basis, but becoming the sort of de facto platform um, that ultimately replaces some of the legacy tools. Well, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, thinking about Procore and Autodesk. Neither one of them, I think, has become that default platform. Some of the companies uh, kind of patch into that, those individual solutions that you mentioned do you feel like we're close to getting one, you know, a platform to kind of rule them all? And and do you think it would be Procore or Autodesk or something that maybe doesn't even exist yet? Yeah, I think Procore and Autodesk um, are definitely large incumbents in the space. They've done phenomenally well. They both have their own origin stories. You know, Autodesk really focused on the design and 3D modeling. They really excel there. Procore really emerged in the era of tablets and iPhones to say, Here's a better way to communicate and collaborate. So they're different, um, but I think they both serve important roles in the industry. A lot of the companies that I'm seeing startups really need to engage and actually um, embed themselves and integrate with these dominant players because they are um, they do have a lot of market share. So I think integrating and partnering is key. Um, but I also think it's finding the areas that the behemoths don't want to do themselves. Find the, the pain points, whether it's financial forecasting and figuring out a way to better forecast project budgets and, and outcomes. Um, do it better than, than the incumbents. I think there's still so many opportunities for innovation um, and really finding pain points that 
are either underutilized um, features of some of the big guys. So there's still plenty of room. So I wanted to talk to you about construction materials and the supply chain. We've been up and down with lumber this year with mm-hmm. steel. Apparently there was a resin shortage at one point. Um, how does tech kind of help deal with the supply chain problems? Yeah. So supply chain has been, I think, a key focus this year, given all the disruptions. It's impacted project schedules, project costs, and everything. I think I'm really excited about the opportunity to really embed financial services. And I say that because um, there's an opportunity to embed supply chain financing for subcontractors um, and really engaging them in suppliers and even payments. And so I think 2020 sort of shocked the system, um, but there's a ton of opportunity. I think people are more, more focused on platforms that really serve subcontractors and helping them procure materials. Because at the end of the day, it's their responsibility to get the materials and the labor on site. And that's a big, big task. And so I think there's more focus than ever, given the disruption, as well as this broader theme of embedding fintech into platforms is going to be monumental for supply chain companies um, that have had increased attention this year. Wanted to get your opinion also on factory construction. Uh, Katera filed for Chapter 11, but then I noticed its factories got picked up pretty quickly by others in the space. Feels like factory building is still going to be the future, but yet there's been, it hasn't been the future as fast as I would have thought. What do you think is kind of some of the issues there? I think you're absolutely right. I, I think it's well known in the industry that factory building increases Um, efficiency, quality, and affordability. Absolutely. And I think people recognize that. We still struggle with an adoption and scalability problem, right? So stick built is still the dominant way that we consume and deliver housing and building. The two things that come to mind in terms of some of the challenges that factory built um, construction faces are twofold. One, actual delivery and transportation to on-site as well as financing. And I can talk a little bit about that. So when you build in a factory, you know, you have to be mindful of the design because design is now front loaded. And so I think designing to build in a factory, but also designing to have it be transported to on site, which is sort of even harder in dense urban areas. It can be costly. It can be prohibitively costly and it can be challenging to navigate the logistical challenges of physical delivery. I think that's sort of a key focus as to sort of how you think about where the factories are relative to the on-site. Um, the second thing is financing. And I think about factory built versus site built. When you build on site, the draw process is a monthly process where lenders disperse payment based on percentage of completed milestones. On site, that is front-loaded and lenders have to get comfortable with excuse me, with larger upfront costs, given the nature of the expenses and the production that is front loaded when you build in a factory. And so there's a little bit of lenders getting comfortable with that risk, with that new risk and perception of risk um, and developing a more, I think, robust financing vehicle um, in motion for um, factory built housing and construction more broadly. Well, that's really interesting. I hadn't necessarily thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. We're, we're so wired into that draw process that that's always the way it works. But with factory built, you've really got, you've got the factory portion and then you've got that installing portion and the process kind of exists on those two ends of the spectrum. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about, uh, ESG and green. So I think, People are very interested right now in monitoring uh, energy, water, things like that. Construction waste, certainly. We keep hearing those statistics on construction waste. Are you looking at any companies that are tracking those sort of things? Yeah. ESG is critical to real estate and construction, considering the fact that the built environment, meaning the operation of buildings as well as the construction of buildings, represents 40% of CO2 emissions globally. So it is critical. It is top of mind. When I, you know, at Tom Best, we are focused on construction and real estate. 
I'd say our interest is really that intersection of finance and construction, so payments and lending and insurance. And ESG is involved in all of that, but I'd say the the specific areas of environment, social and governance, um, and the emphasis on one of those areas will you know differ depending on the particular investment. But I'd say given the the focus on the built environment and how much it contributes to emissions, I think everyone is focused on this in in the industry, um, and it is top of mind. I think when you think about finance and and payments, it's really the S thinking about who's impacted. How are we paying subs faster? How are we getting payments to people in the right hands in a compliant, safe way? So there are ways to think about ESG, even from the fintech and construction tech perspective. Are things like decentralized finance and cryptocurrency having any impact on on construction finance, or is that still still pretty fringe? I think it's pretty early, but I wouldn't be surprised um, at the innovation that's coming the way to the sort of built environment. I think the built environment and prop tech and construction tech, I like to say is, you know, prop tech's maybe three to five years behind fintech and construction tech is right behind that. And so the innovation will come, particularly in payments and lending. It's interesting that you made that distinction between prop tech and construction tech. Do you feel like investors are more interested in prop tech because they finally got comfortable with it? It seemed like for years, nobody was comfortable with prop tech. Now they're all in on prop tech, but is construction tech kind of lagging behind that? I think so. Um, and I think it starts with you know consumer-facing technologies. So thinking about prop tech as relates to home ownership and home buyers and aiding that process. And then it goes more into commercial. Um, and then construction will follow, given it's sort of the least consumer-facing part of the prop tech world, um, as well as it's sort of the supply of the real estate chain. So um, that's how I think about the trend and wave of technology in terms of the cadence from you know the most consumer-facing to sort of the back office, if you will. That makes sense. So I interviewed Lauren Lake and Mallory Brody from Bridget recently. I know that's one of the companies on your map. They do uh, workforce uh, workforce management. With them, I talked about how there aren't a lot of women on the construction side of real estate, either you know on the tech side or on the on-site side as well. What are you seeing and do you think that's starting to change to some extent? I've had the pleasure of getting to know both Lauren and Mallory. Um, and I think super highly of them. Um, I'm impressed by what they've been building at Bridget. And I think they actually have really pioneered sort of a model in the space around building a team and building, you know, a culture that's really strong and a culture that brings in people that don't necessarily have construction backgrounds, but can build a team well and can learn how to solve problems in this industry. And so I commend them for the, for the work they've done, because I think that's exactly the way you bring in more women and more people who don't necessarily have this sort of specific experience. But when you can look at someone and look at their future potential, their aptitude and their ability to solve hard problems um, and bring them in from their various backgrounds, I think that's exactly the way you bring in more people um, into an industry that hasn't had sort of a ton of diverse faces and thoughts. That's true. So you've got 150 uh, companies on that map. Is there any aspect of construction that you feel like hasn't been covered by any startups yet? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think there's been so much. And I think I go back to over the last five to 10 years, there's more data, there are more platforms, more point solutions than ever. I'm really excited about the companies that are now taking all of the data and integrating it orchestrating the data and having it actually deliver on financial outcomes. So reducing the cost of financing, reducing the number of days it takes to get paid, um, and better reflecting risk among workers on site as well as overall projects. And I think we're still trying to actually deliver on those tangible outcomes. I think there's a lot that's working towards that goal. Um, but to the extent that companies can help sort of um, not add to the noise, but actually simplify all of the data, IoT and tech that's sort of 
been dispersed into the industry, you know, from more funding, from the venture side to strategics, I think it's all great. But now we need to sort of focus a little bit more and deliver on those outcomes. Excellent. So thank you so much for this. As we wrap up, uh, you have a very, it's, it's clear that you have a very, uh, sort of focused approach to a very specific area. I'm curious how you got into this particular niche and what really, what do you love about it? Well, I love that real estate and construction touches everyone and, um, you know, it touches, it, it, it's the built environment. It's the spaces that we live in, we grow up in, we inhabit. I think of housing and, you know, I tend to believe that housing and the access to decent housing is a fundamental human right. And so that excites me. And the fact that technology can make it better, make it more efficient, reduce the cost is powerful. And so that's what excites me about real estate construction, the supply of real estate. Um, and I feel, you know, honored that I have the, you know, privilege to get to speak to people who are building and innovating every day. So, um, that's been my focus and sort of the reason why it's been just fun for me to sort of work in this space. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, for listeners, you can find Lauren's work at tomfest.com. Stay well and stay invested. Thank you. Thanks, Deidre. This is fun.